Creating a literary festival is always special. It's always different, with each being a journey of creation, a response to our world. This year has been like none other, highlighting what it means to be human and the joys and comfort found in shared experiences. As readers, we turn to books to find solace, strength, inspiration and understanding. The authors we explore are documenting the stories of our times and helping us gain a better understanding of where the world might go next. The power of reading and the need for connection and community has inspired the 41st edition of the Toronto International Festival of Authors. And I welcome you warmly to share in this festival and our celebration of stories. Buy a book, discover new ideas, and share them with friends. Dive into this year's festival and enjoy hundreds of virtual events. Consider donating to the festival, if you can, to help support our free program and to help us continue to support writers. Ask big questions and bring people together as we attempt to bring our new world into focus. We respectfully acknowledge that words and ideas have been shared on this land for thousands of years. The land on which we operate has been occupied by the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. It is part of the Dish with One Spoon territory and is still home to many indigenous people. We pay respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. We thank those who have cared for the land and are sharing it with us. We are grateful to be here, connecting with others in the celebration of stories. Hello, and welcome to the 41st edition of the Toronto International Festival of Authors, Canada's largest and longest running literary festival. My name is Catherine Graham, and I am the author of the debut novel, Quarry, and my sixth poetry collection is titled The Celery Forest. Thank you for joining us for the reread, The Wars, by Timothy Finley. Published in 1977, this groundbreaking modern classic is one of the most innovative and highly acclaimed fictional accounts of World War I, told through the perspective of Robert Ross, a sensitive 19-year-old Canadian officer who went to war, the war to end all wars. He found himself in the nightmare world of trench warfare, of mud and smoke, of chlorine gas and rotting corpses. In this world gone mad, Robert Ross performed a last desperate act to declare his commitment to life in the midst of death. In partnership with the Writers' Trust of Canada, we are pleased to present these digital book clubs within the 2020 festival. By matching a contemporary writer with a work from our past of cultural significance, we hope over the next 45 minutes to gain insight into a significant artist and a significant work from both a fellow practitioner and from you, the audience. Like a book club in a living room, the writer presents the work in conversation and then you viewers may chime in with your responses and perspectives. We'll start with a conversation with Charlie Foran about the wars and at the end we will take questions from you, our audience. So please add your questions to the chat box throughout the event. Charlie Fran is the author of 11 books of fiction and nonfiction. He is the executive director of the Writers' Trust of Canada. Welcome, Charlie. Catherine, Hello. <laughs> Lovely to see you in this virtual world. Lovely to see you too. Yeah. And I'm excited to talk to you about this powerful book. Here it is right here. And um, I thought Charlie possibly could begin with um, your connection to Timothy Finley and then your connection to the wars. As a younger writer, I knew uh, to Finley a little. A lot of people did. He was a very gregarious, generous man who had a, a, a lot of time for younger artists, both from the theatrical world and the literary world. As you know, he straddled those two. So I did uh, 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 have the opportunity to spend some time with him. And he was a very important writer to me as a younger novelist. Uh, the Wars, uh, Not One on the Voyage, Famous Last Words, Headhunter. These were very big books when I was coming of age. And between um, Finley's big books, important books, serious books, and his very um, dynamic and, and dramatic personality, he was a force. And it was a thrill for me to be able to watch him uh, when I was starting out. Mm -hmm. 
And the, mm -hmm, I was go just ahead. Say the wars itself was probably one of two or three books I read by Canadians at a formative moment, which would have been my, I think it came out in 77, Catherine. Mm -hmm. So I think I read it in paperback maybe a year later, maybe a year, two years later. And it was a thunderbolt. I had never encountered a book by almost anybody at that stage that had that sort of force. It was electric, it was charged, it had a kind of fury. Uh, I, I've never, I ne had never understood how anger or righteous indignation could get translated into prose until I read The Wars. And it was very Canadian. It was, at the beginning at least, set in Toronto, pre-World War I Toronto, or on the eve of the war, at the beginning of the war. And there was never any question that we weren't dealing with a view of World War I from a Canadian perspective. So that was all very exciting when I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. And in your rereading of it, what was it like then for you as, as, a, as, as a, a writer and, and an accomplished writer and sort of the journey there, what was that like for you? From, it was from illustrative of a whole bunch of things. Uh, I was reminded just in researching for our little conversation that Finley was 47 when he published this and had only had two books previously yeah. Uh, quite a number of years before, neither had been a great success. He has he was a fairly successful TV writer and, of course, had had a career on stage when he was young. But this was not this was not a uh, uh, this was maybe a make or break book for him. And he took a long time to write it, even though it's not long, 200 pages to 220, depending on the edition. And clearly he threw everything he had at it. And when I reread it, and I, I taught this book once in a short course on how to read like a writer, where, bit, where I kind of broke it down with students. And I, I remember then, so I would have been in my 40s then, when I read it, I thought, oh, I don't know about some of the framing. Um, Finley has the, there's a sort of novel in a novel in a novel a little bit. Mm -hmm. You have to come in and out of the action. There's literally first, second, and third person narration. Very unusual, all three. And I, I remember when I was talking to this with some students, I, some years ago, I said, I'm not sure that it was necessary. Now I think I understand better why he framed it that way, why he t was so deliberate. It's like the book wants to go in very close, particularly those powerful battle scenes, you know, the, the, the crater, the horses, the dike. And then he wants to pull right back. And he wants you to get close to Robert Ross, the young man who's the protagonist. And then he wants to pull you right back because... All of a sudden, this is a memory thing, and it's people 50 years later trying to remember. So he he's actually operating in a very sophisticated way as a novelist. This is a very sophisticated novel. And at the same time, it is at heart, and you used this word when we were chatting the other day, it's a visceral novel. It doesn't. It's not intellectual. It wants to punch you in the gut and to break your heart. Mm -hmm. And that's something in 200 pages. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a book that never leaves you. I know for myself when I read it, it just shot to one of the most memorable book, books that I've read and I was so excited to talk to you about it today mm -hmm. and, uh, and rereading it as well. Um, I found my heart rate went up and my body clenched and I, but I couldn't help but keep reading. So it just, as you say, it pulls you in and keeps you there and the vividness and the visceral quality, everything seems to be uh, so tight so you mm -hmm. can just tell there's such a craft behind this. I wonder if you could talk about the style, the craft, or anything else about that. I'm guessing, and I don't know this, uh, there is a biography of him coming out uh, yeah. right now, and, mm -hmm. and, I'll, yeah. I'll, and I will learn. I'm guessing it went through many, many drafts and many, many iterations. I'm guessing it was once quite a bit bigger. Mm. Like it doesn't have that feeling to you like he chopped and he chopped and he chopped, and he just exactly. kept whittling away on the edges of scenes. Yes. And of course, he was a playwright. You know, mm -hmm. so playwrights, there's you go right to it. You're forever in medias res. You're right in the moment. Mm -hmm. And of course, he and he wrote for television, which is the very mi barest minimum of setups. Mm -hmm. So what what struck me is that the, there's uh, is that there's such minimal setup, and he moves very quickly from thing to thing. And some of the scenes are enormous, like the crater scene, the justifiably yes. celebrated scene mm -hmm. in the crater. And then yeah. other scenes are like a short paragraph and they will often have the, sometimes the same um, 
not necessarily impact because the longer scenes, as you say, you your heart rate goes up. Mm-hmm. But some of the shorter ones, they're all of a piece. There's a tremendous unity that, you know, I was reminded of the very end with, on his gravestone, right? His earth, yeah. fire, and water. Yeah. And this is a novel of elements. Yes. It's an elemental novel about violence, predation, the way mm-hmm. humans prey upon each other. It's an elemental novel about our extremely um, unhealthy relationship with the natural world. The, the, the book is forever contrasting awful human behavior towards each other with yes. animals, the mm-hmm. animal world. So it's an elemental novel. So every single sentence was infused somehow with Finley's um, desire to, to, to use language to actually, I think, ultimately express something which is not about language, which is how everything, everyone is in the world, is in this world. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, and it's, so the, there is a tremendous craft there. And, I'm, and as I said, I, I, am suspect, I suspect it, it was bigger. And I suspect he had to, he, he wanted to keep whittling it down so there was no excuse for the reader <laughs> and no, what no breathing spaces yeah no breathing spaces yeah, that makes sense for you yeah yeah it fully really makes sense and, and um what's so interesting is that he'll sort of jump to these really powerful just one sentence just floating there and you mm. feel it and and because of um there's so much layering in the book we talked about that briefly as well too i wonder if you could talk about the layering or how that affected you as a reader Uh, the uh, again, because I've now read it in three different periods in my life, and yeah. w- what a wonderful thing about getting older is you can revisit books, and they're and and they aren't changing, but you are. Yes. So you're seeing them differently. So mm-hmm. to go back, I had the teenage read of this book, which was like, you know, the Emily Dickinson line that had you know the blew my head top of my head off. Mm-hmm. Um, then I had the middle of my life where I was studying it as a text with students and I was very admiring, but I was questioning some, a few of the decisions Finley had made to now where I'm just understanding that this is, this is a whole experience and you're not supposed to uh, uh, analyze it too, too much. So I think the layering to, that you described is really about dramatic effect. And I like, for instance, some of the, some readers now, for instance, may be, Um, have questions about the irregular punctuation, um, the way he will space out sentences on the page, you know, some of the kind of concrete stuff Mm -hmm. that was more popular, I think, 30, 40 years ago. I mean, there are a couple of aspects aspects of this book that dated a little bit to the period. There was a lot of experimentation in the novel in the 60s and 70s, and some of it was uh, coming over from poetry. So you re-examine the page, although, of course, some of the modernists like Joyce did that too. Mm. Um, so there's a bit of that, and then Finley had a thing for lowercase. Uh, he liked lowercase, where other people would do uppercase words. So your eye has to adjust sometimes to the page, but he's there's always intent there, and that intent is to is to create a sort of um, a continuous emotional experience, analogous analogous to Robert Ross's the, the protagonist. Mm-hmm. And yeah. Robert Ross is a 19-year-old boy, you know, and he falls into the to the action of the novel when he volunteers after the death of his sister Rowena, and after that, it is essentially a cascading, unfolding nightmare, um, ending the way it ends, which is awfully awful, mm-hmm. but I think very true. So Finley was always, I think, thinking about like almost like a dramatist. I have three hours. I have two and a half hours with you, Catherine, in a dark space. You know, I'm not going to let you out. Of, I'm going to, I'm going to break your heart at minute 30, 60, 90, 120, you know? Yeah. And I love that about the book. It's very instructive to younger yeah. writers if they wish it to be about how to. Yeah. Like a domino effect. Yeah. Where one, one effect, another effect, and it just sort of, that motion just continues all the way through um, animals are a big part of this novel, and uh, 
I wondered if you wanted to say something about that and, and how that affected you as a reader, any thoughts on the animals? There's so many. Sure. Well, let me, let me flip it around just for a second before I answer. Did you take yeah. different note of the animals when you reread it than when you read it when you were young? Yes, I think I probably didn't realize how many there were um, mm -hmm. because you kind of then just see all of these encounters are, are just so powerful. And then going back to the rabbits, Rowena mm -hmm. and the loss of his sister, and we're not giving anything away um, to readers as well because that's right at the beginning. So already you're dealing with loss, which is big enough. And some novels mm -hmm. would deal with that loss, but this just continues. And, um, and I think as well, we just see how um, this exchange of what makes an animal an animal, a human a human, and then this other category of almost um, non-human and mm -hmm. not an animal uh, because of the horror of, of, of what can happen from war and so on. So That's very beautiful. That's an interesting third category, the non-human, because I've been thinking a lot about um, the way the novel, as I said before, lets you up close to the human characters somewhat, yeah. but never too much. Mm -hmm. And in part, I've always assumed that was just because Finley wanted to remind you that they were probably all gonna be killed fairly quickly. Right. And there is, a, there was a, I mean, talk about trauma. This book is traumatized, mm -hmm. trauma from page one to page 220. Mm -hmm. And trauma as it wasn't understood, as you know, yes. nearly well enough during that mm -hmm. catastrophic war. Um, uh, but the animals, I think, uh, I think I understand them differently now than I do when I was younger, the, the, because I feel like in the course of the say thirty years, thirty-five years since I first read this book, mm -hmm. um, our uh, our converse, the conversation we're having about humans in the world versus the world, mm -hmm. how and our long assumption that we were here to dominate. Yeah. everything else and that we were somehow not animals the way cats mm -hmm. or dogs or horses are animals uh it's broadly known by some as post-humanism um, now that we're trying to balance rebalance this because obviously humans have come close to are coming close mm -hmm. to destroying the planet yeah. for no particular reason um except that we you know we're restless or something or foolish I, I see the I see the, the animals in the wars as maybe the most radical aspect of the book, mm. or most ahead of its time. I mean, this is a historical novel. So this is a novelist in the seventies writing about the mm. humans. But you can you can put Finley's um, moral outrage about the treatment of the animals, and of course, when you're younger, at least I was, I was just fixated on the destruction of all those horses. Yes. The slaughter of the horses. Mm -hmm. But now, as you say, it's not just horses, cats, it's it's birds. Birds are huge in the book. Yes. There's dogs, there's mm -hmm. a toad, there's hedgehogs, there's mm -hmm. there's just they're almost a parallel cast. Like if you had a cast, you could have the human cast and then the animal cast, which he did later and not one on the voyage, of course. Right. He yeah. literalized it with Noah's Ark mm -hmm. and humans. But in the wars, he's he I feel that that was a very, very um prescient insight and it was coming from a place in finley's moral character as a, as a novelist that uh is if anything should be um, more appreciated and more of our time than it was even of 30 40 50 years ago we now are beginning to reckon with our misunderstanding of our proper place in the world now, offsetting that, Catherine, in the wars is just the sheer, appalling, endless violence of man on man or human on human. Mm -hmm. And I can't, uh, being reminded of the carnage of World War One. Mm -hmm. um, like I was, I was thinking about. So the novel most was set in 1916. Yeah. And in, and I and I kept thinking, okay, so we're talking about the Battle of Ypres, uh, and then I read up about Ypres, and Ypres actually. Is a, is a series of protracted battles. You know, and battles didn't end. And they went on for weeks, months, years. Mm -hmm. And this is actually, we use this as a banner to describe a series of battles over a four year period that in which the casualty count was three quarters of a million people, mm -hmm. more than the civil war in America. I mean, 
we're talking grotesque numbers. Mm -hmm. And then that's just the dead. How about the wounded? Yes. And how about the traumatized, the gassed? How mm -hmm. about the, you know all the, the the people who are just devastated by this? The the wars. I think this goes back to the idea of it being wanting to be visceral and not wanting. He's not making an intellectual argument here about the nature of war. No. laws in human nature, something like that. He's mm -hmm. saying to you, look at, look at this landscape. Look at the destruction. Look at what we're doing to everything. Look what we're doing to ourselves. Mm -hmm. I think that's in part to go back to the characters, why he's, he's, he's not reluctant, but he's very, he, he's very careful about how much he lets you invest in the characters, including Robert. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you find Robert innately sympathetic and interesting? I did. I did from the start. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and when you see, too, what he goes through and what he does at the end and how then he his life just completely changes from that, but also what happens to him, he's dealing with so much, and yet at the, at the same time he's maintaining, trying to maintain his humanity, and that humanity is, again, connected to animals. So it's really that sort of that portal to um, to somehow stay sane and uh, and to to connect to the living rather than the killing. Um, and yes. uh, yeah, that's beautifully put because in the final, you know, the opening is the final, almost the final pages, right? Yeah. Over. Yes. And mm -hmm. in the opening, you don't know yet what Robert's done. No. But you know that he's essentially in in contented commune with a dog and a black horse. Yeah. There are no people, mm -hmm. and 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 the novel I think comes pretty close to saying a sensitive human is as likely to have a connection with an animal from another species as they are with another human. Mm -hmm. And he does too. When I think of that really strong connection, well, obviously to Rowena, his sister, but he's lost her, and then he's he's connecting to Harris and. Mm -hmm. um, and it's an immediate connection. And sometimes that happens in our lives where it's just one of the, it's almost just meeting, dare I say, like a, a soulmates, not necessarily in a um, romantic way, but just in a knowing and connection way. And he experiences that loss as well, too. I wondered if you wanted to say anything about that or add anything to that or. Mm -hmm. Loss is a huge, a huge driving force in this book. Yeah. A loss starts on page five or whenever Rowena does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then his mother, Mrs. Ross, is fairly dismaying, um, saying to him, well, you're on your own. The yeah. world's that is cold. I can't help you. You can't help me. We're all mm -hmm. born apart. Yeah. And then it just carries on. And every significant relationship he has ends with, with catastrophic loss. Mm -hmm. um, and then in the end, I'd be interested in your thoughts. I feel like I, I've been thinking about whether Robert wills him his own uh, annihilation. Um, like he's seen so much of it. He's acted honorably. I mean, what he does at the end, we can discuss if it's honorable or not. Mm -hmm. It's certainly extreme and it involves, you know, killing humans, um, mm -hmm. not in a, in a direct war context, not the enemy such as the enemy mm -hmm. is. And I think Finley has essentially no, places no credibility to the idea of an enemy in this book. The enemy is everybody around him. I mean, there's that horrible scene in the in the baths where he's raped, mm -hmm. so, and it's his own officers. Yes. So it, by the end, there's such loss, and there's such a sense of there's just no no hope of finding someone who you should attach yourself to because they might be gone the next day. You might be gone, or you might be so scarred physically or psychologically. Um, mm -hmm. it, it is. It is in that sense a conventional, to use the language, a searing indictment of, of just how terrible war is. Mm -hmm. Now, what I don't, what, what, you know, what a different kind of novelist would have done, he's, he would have backed you into that. So you understood how the world came to fight this appalling war and insanely pointless war. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, sometimes these lines didn't move for years. Mm -hmm. Or they would gain a hundred yards yes. that cost fifty thousand lives. Then they would lose the hundred yards. There is some mention of that. Mm -hmm. But a yeah. different kind of novelist would have backed you into that and told you 
how that came to pass. But as I, as we said before, Finley's not interested in motivation uh, politics. He's interested in the uh, experience of animals, uh, us included. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And, and it also too, we get um, we come from families, whatever that means for our our connection to family. And he, of course, comes from a family. And um, one of the strongest characters in that family, I felt too, was Mrs. Ross. And uh, and I wondered if you could talk about the effect that she had on you as a reader. Anything to say about her? Well, let me just read this passage you yeah. and I discussed the other day. Because mm -hmm. so this is this is this. Cre I'm going to say creepy is the wrong word. Unsettling early scene when when yes. Robert is enlisted after his sister's death, mm -hmm. and he's taking a bath in their house house in Rosedale, and he comes from a upper class family. And his mother comes in. Uh, she has an alcohol problem, and she sits by the bathtub. And she says this about, so Rowena is Robert's sister. He says, you think Rowena belonged to you. Well, I'm here to tell you, Robert, no one belongs to anyone. We're all cut off at birth with a knife and left at the mercy of strangers. You hear that? Strangers. I know what you want to do. I know you're going to go away and be a soldier. Well, you can go to hell. I'm not responsible. I'm just another stranger. Birth, I can give you, but life, I cannot. I can't keep anyone alive not anymore i mean that wow yes wow that, that is that that sets a tone for human mm -hmm. relations um, it certainly does and it kind and of I just drop it kind of just drops Catherine. it's just what yeah. where, where did that come from? and i think that's the dramatist in him he's not going to yeah. give you any heads up no he's just going to land that <laughs> Boom! Yeah, just yeah. like a bomb, really. Like a bomb, uh, like a bomb. There's a lot of bombs yeah. in this. Mm -hmm. There are yeah. a lot of bombs. Yeah. Emotional bombs, um, physical bombs, and mm -hmm. silence. The silence as well is a bomb in, in the way that it works. But going to that 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 scene that you just read um, and hearing her voice again, the fact that she is dealing with an alcohol um, situation problem, whatever the word you want to say about that in some ways too makes sense for her wanting to escape from her pain. So that idea too, um, she may have been as sensitive as her son, but in learning through loss that that, that sensitivity is, is just too much for her to somehow dull it. And um, that's her route to doing that. And how much does she really believe what she's saying or feels she has to say it as a way of coping? I mean, all of those things come to mind for me. It's never that simple, of course, with dialogue and character. And uh, it just adds to the complexity and depth of the characters and just to how dialogue can just do that. And when it's yeah. done powerfully, as, as yeah. you just said, yeah. yeah it, it is powerful and you're right. I mean, if you look at some of the, um, the, the book has several long unbroken passages of narration. Usually when people are telling the unnamed narrator about Robert, about incidents. Yes. But they're mm -hmm. all full of subtle character um, uh, inflections. Uh, and as you say, like a good dra dramatist, Finley could, could render character through dialogue beautifully. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to your point about the alcoholism and, and the loss, yes, uh, he, again, he doesn't spend a lot of time saying, look, this is, someone who, this is a woman who's just lost her daughter. And by her son enlisting with the cat in 19... Let's say fall of fifteen or whatever it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She 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 had a pretty good idea. He was he might not come back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Statistically, yeah. Canadians had a crazy high rate of mortality fighting World War One. We were a small nation, and the number of dead is shocking. So, of course, she is speaking from a place of despair and 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 saying, "Look, I'm helpless." You know, agency is agency, and you know, you birth a child, and then they become their own person. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's it does. What is so striking about it is is that it's so unequivocal, it's so unsentimental. This is not a sentimental book. No, book. no. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and that, animals, that's not always easy to pull off, right? I mean, animals and rabbits, and yeah. <laughs> isn't that impressive? Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. isn't that impressive? He things are there for a reason. And the effect he wants is not sentiment. No. It is emotion, but mm -hmm. it's powerful, deep emotion. Mm -hmm. Yes. The other thing that comes to mind that could have been a, taken him a different direction is, of course, you know, Robert Ross on paper is 
is similar to the doom generation of the poets, Sassoon, yes. and Wilfred Owen. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, they're, over the decades, they did come to be valorized a bit mm -hmm. as handsome, you know, high cheekbone young men who went off honorably. And, and there was a, romance is the wrong word because it was so catastrophic, yeah. but there was a, a sort of honor and that could have been tra have translated in another writer's hands. And I can think of a couple other novels where it has mm -hmm. into at least a sort of slightly sentimental depiction of youth. Right. Yeah. And there, there's lots of young people in this book. All the other soldiers are kids, mm -hmm. pretty much. Mm -hmm. But there is no sentiment. And Robert is uh, observant and thoughtful. And he would have made a fine man. But he's not in any way a romanticized figure. Mm -hmm. And he does do terrible things, Catherine, at the end. At yeah. least ostensibly, he's court-martialed. Yeah. Uh, I think, I think. I mean, this is such a great book to teach because at the end you would just say to students, well, is he or isn't he a criminal? Do you have mm -hmm. an answer to that, by the way? Well, again, I think it's never black and white. And I think that's what is so powerful about everything about this novel. And to see it in that way minimizes so much. So mm -hmm. I think it's, to me, I mean, when I think too, as a teacher as well and teaching poetry, um, Billy Collins has this line in Introduction to Poetry, all they wanna do is tie it to a chair and beat it with a rope to find out, or beat it with a hose to find out what it really means, right? Like, what do you mean, what do you mean? And I think what's so powerful when something has many meanings embedded in it, depending on how you look at it. And I think that's so much of, any story that's being told, which depending on how you look at it and how mm. you see it. So I think too, going to your point about the various sort of ways of storytelling that happens here and the layering, um, that I think adds to the complexity and the fragmentation and the word myth is used as well too. And will we ever know the truth? And can we ever know the truth? And with trauma as well, um, how the mind and body can process to know what really happened. I mean, there's so many things going on. We have the shell shock, um, repetition of something. Isn't it amazing? I think that was one of the lines that Isn't was said. Isn't it marvelous? Isn't it marvelous? Yeah, isn't Everything. It marvelous, right? It could be like yeah. a, a pile of corpses. Isn't it marvelous? Yeah. 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 People lost their minds in these trenches. Mm -hmm. Young men, men, they went crazy. They lost their minds. Um, they were, they, these, these were suicide uh, yes. missions. Mm -hmm. and, uh, no so, preparation. Pardon yeah. me? No preparation. You sort of um, just, you know, you're going in sort of this idealistic way, at least that was my impression of, of what was given in the novel. And, and, and for Robert, she was kind of an escape to get away from the grief of his sister. And, and uh, I felt that that was part of sort of the initiation to want to go. And didn't he view um, his sister's boyfriend in a uniform and think, oh, maybe that's what I should do. I think in the funeral possibly, or yeah, just that. that, that well, isn't, it, isn't, it, isn't it true that young men fight wars because old men won't do it. Yes. They know better. They're not going to go over the top. Oh, um, no. I, mean, I mean, in World War One, by the end, they were en enlisting or drafting older men. Mm -hmm. But young men are, don't understand death. Yeah. And yeah. so they they will enlist. They will enlist because it's, sure, this is the young people are, it's, it's why among the many, many immoralities of war is that it's almost always conducted by older men, conducted or initiated by older men, but it's younger men that do the dying. Mm -hmm. And now younger women increasingly. But in this book, obviously, it was a, it was a and, and, and it literally in this in the case of World War One, it actually wiped out almost the entire generation of youth yeah. mm -hmm. in many, several countries and mm -hmm. served no purpose which would make you want to be a rabbit and not a human. Or a toad. Or a toad, or a toad, yes. Going back to your comment too about the animals, they, they connect to the elements as well. When you think of birds with air and toads with earth and just that, that sort of sense of um, all, all the, the different kinds of animals, the complexity there, and of course, horses as well, yeah. Of course, horses. Horses mm -hmm. have a special place in the book. Mm -hmm. And I know, you know, horses, I, I'm, I'm vaguely remembering the film. There was a film made about eight years afterwards and it fixated a lot on the horses, which is natural. Um, they're very dramatic em emblems and they, and a lot of World War I was still fought. Mm -hmm. Well, it wasn't fought on horseback because they weren't practical and the 
mm-hmm. you know, battle scene, but they were still a big, big part of it, these operations. 19th century operations. I mean, the, it, it's a good reminder how, you know, the cliche, the Margaret Macmillan thesis, you know, that the 20th century began, at, you know, beginning of World War One. But World War One was fought in a 19th century way, which is why it was so bloody and stupid. Yes. Facing yeah. off like that, you know, uh, standing up and shooting each other, just yes. point blank, crazy. Yeah. And yet there's still hope, isn't there? I mean, I feel that with the last sort of sentence in the novel and also um, moments within that hanging on to someone's sketchbook or the stained glass that one of the other soldiers collects and the mm. idea too of photographs having meaning um, and uh, yeah, it's, um, and from what I know too, um, Timothy Finley used to sign his books with hope against despair and there's against despair in the novel as well. Mm. I think that's important to sort of yeah. continue with that hope. Yeah. I think so too. I think so too. I would, I would suggest that, it's thin gruel in this book to hope. Um, yeah. It is is sort of a no one gets out of here alive scenario, yeah. pretty much. I mean, there are, you notice it's the, the women that the narrator, sorry, the, the people that the narrator interviews 50 years later are all women. Yes, they are. Yeah. And really powerful um, aspects of the novel as well. When I think of young Juliet and her observation skills and then the nurses as well. And at one point, Robert is allowed a passageway out of life and he says not yet. So I thought that again, talking about dialogue and just two words being resonating so much, but I can't believe how quickly our time is going, Charlie. And I, and I see that we are um, sort of at the stage now to take some Q and A. So I should check into that. And right. uh, yeah, yeah. Time is flying just as the novel flew when I read it again. Um, yes, here we are. Pleased to learn of Finley's pending biography, pending biography, but I wonder how each of you would assess his relevance and status in the pantheon of Canlit now, almost two decades after his passing. Charlie, we spoke a little bit about that. I wondered if you could talk about that. Mm-hmm. Well, I think The Wars is a is a great Canadian novel. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was read. It was taught. Um, I'm not sure it is as much as it, say, 20 years ago. As for Finley's status, uh, I would suggest that almost all writers who 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 passed out of the scene at the turn of the the millennium and at the advent at the outset of the digital age have suffered premature oblivion. Mm. So that could be Carol Shields, Timothy Finley. Robertson Davies, Mordecai Richler. There's a good sized list there. It, it, there was a lot of uh, a lot of people passed from that first generation, I guess. It was Glant in the early years of the last decade. Uh, I, I'm not. Uh, there are lots of reasons why that's happened, and I and I'm hinting at them with the, yeah. the very very idea of the way what digital culture does to the past. But I would certainly suggest that. Uh, this novel, uh, not uh, uh, famous last words, which is so germane still to how we understand the British monarchy and that society. I, I think they're f- not one on the voyage. If we go to the idea back to the idea of Finley being an avatar, uh, uh, an early uh, proponent of a post-humanist uh, view and understanding of the world, I think all these reasons make Timothy Finley a writer people should be reading now. Thank you for that. And of course, something like this, the reread and how rereading, and even if it's not a reread, reintroducing novels that are important and of value and uh, bringing them to the surface again. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Um, Let's see, we have another one here. Finley came after the original Canadian greats, such as McClellan, Callahan, Richler. They are rarely seen in the bookstores unless you dig in. Is Finley's oeuvre his short stories and other novels read outside Canlit class. I, I do, for, for reasons I won't go into, I do know a bit about that. And mm-hmm. I know that he continues to sell, not, not, not tens of thousands of copies, but several thousand copies um, a year of his different books, uh, not one on the voyage 
seem to have some admirers in the, for maybe on courses else in different parts of the country. Um, as for bookshops, well, I mean, that's a different conversation. Backlists. Yes. Backlists, whatever happened to backlists? Uh, they were such a lovely component of a bookstore experience where you would see the, the row of titles by an author. There are very few writers who are graced with having their backlist uh, available. Um, so if you don't have a four list, if there's no new work, to the argument I was suggesting earlier, mm -hmm. it's hard right now to, to fight for that, to have that space uh, on sh in bookshops anyhow. Mm -hmm. And perhaps we have time for one more. What would you say to someone to convince them to read this novel? If the reason they're avoiding it because they don't favor war novels? Good mm. question. Mm -hmm. And it kind of brings us round to the relevance. So yeah, go ahead, Charlie. Yeah. I, I mentioned earlier that I, I, I was interested in, in the um, the way Finley had channeled his his rage, and uh, because he, this book is written in a in a in a white heat of fury, it may have taken him many years to do it, but it, it feels like he just he kept distilling it and distilling it so that, as we said earlier, yes. you couldn't you couldn't help but be powerfully affected by what mm -hmm. you were reading. Um, I don't think that's particular to World War One. I. I think you can. You can do that as a writer, if, if we're talking about why a writer should read this writer, an aspiring or an actual mm -hmm. writer. The effects that Finley uses to achieve this powerful outcome are applicable to anything. It could be any scenario. It, it is true that war scenes have a drama, but they can also be, frankly, um, tedious. Uh, you know, what, what's the, the cliche of war? It's, you know, 12 hours of boredom punctuated by 10 minutes of terror, you know. Right. And many no, no, war novels have a lot of that boredom or a lot of the, the, the sort of the stuff, the mechanics of it. I think there's a, you could argue that this isn't even strangely enough about war. This is about predation. This is, this is about the way humans prey upon each other. Yes. So you could, if you, it might seem unlikely given the title, given the fact that it all, most of it occurs during World War I, in World War I. Mm -hmm. But I, I would, novels are never their subject. No. They're it's always experience. the experience. Yeah. yeah. They're experience and, they're, and they're, the, they're the broad moral and aesthetic worldview of their authors. Authors are trying to sh show you how they see experience to your, your word, Catherine. So mm. you shouldn't get, too, never get too hung up on the subject of a book. Well, in the writing, I think powerful, powerful writing and uh, never that which is shall die. He starts with Euripides and thankfully this book is here and not dying. And thank you so much, Charlie, for your generous and insightful conversation. I can't believe we are at the point of wrapping up. That just flew by. Um, thank you viewers for joining us for your wonderful conversations with your questions and um You've had a taste of this powerful novel. You can find it through the webpage at TIFA, through the University of Toronto Bookstore. Uh, and viewers, feel free to follow TIFA through Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at the handle at Best of Authors. And uh, thanks for tuning in. Stay safe and keep reading. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine.